Good. Thank you for the kind words, Leonard. Um, it's great to be virtual, virtually with you. I would love to <laughs> one time visit you again now that the pandemic is over, but at least I can virtually meet you now. Um, today, I was asked to talk a bit about um, the current ongoing revolution in deep generative models, um, part of which is probably this, this work of ours that has gone wild on stable diffusion, but uh, there's evidently much more. And uh, as I've been told uh, that you have quite a diverse background, um, I thought I'd give a few words of introduction to generative models and then dive a little bit deeper into um, the latest of research in that particular direction, which is mostly on diffusion models and the like. So when, when trying to represent, when trying to learn from data and learn representations from data, there are um, theoretically two approaches, two different ways that you could go. Uh, the one is the more direct approach, and that is you train a model to directly solve a particular task. You separate two classes from another, or the like, so then you would have a situation that you're having here, a typical discriminative approach. And the other option would be that you, rather than learning a model to solve a particular task, you train a model to just represent the data without knowing the task at hand that would come up later. And you can sense that this is a more generic sort of uh, problem that we would want to solve in the latter case. Um, one which is not specific to a particular problem later. What we had on the left-hand side is typically known as discriminative models, and I understand that you had quite a few of them in your course already. On the right-hand side, um, these are the generative models that I, in this talk, like to discuss a little bit more. Um, the discriminative models on the left concentrate on the so-called class posterior, trying to learn a model of the decision between the classes, not so much of the classes themselves. So you just try to figure out what separates the classes from another, yeah? and you don't really care what the classes look like, you just want to find attributes that separate these classes from another. On the contrary, generative approaches really concentrate on the data likelihood. You want to understand each bit of how the data in that case X here looks like, so we have this case that rather than learning a model of the decision between classes, we actually learn a model of the actual class data. So if you want, uh, discriminative models are a bit like the lousy painter who just amplifies the attribute that separates a zebra from not a zebra, an elephant or whatever, whereas the generative models are the classical great artists that concentrate on all details um, of our data. Discriminative versus generative. The second uh, topic that I want to briefly mention here is uh, the way that we actually learn. You all know that deep learning grow really big on supervised scenarios where you stuff in lots of data, in particular visual data, which is labeled, and you squeeze the neural network, which is just a concatenation of many, many functions, uh, especially convolutions, you squeeze that between the data and the labels so that it, like a device, so that it eventually cannot escape. Now, um, I, like many others, believe that the revolution will eventually not be supervised, as Ayasha so nicely coined it. And we see this already uh, with a lot of deep generative models and also on classical, more discriminative tasks, um, that what we're now looking at is mostly self supervised approaches. So the idea there is that data, especially visual data, is cheap and growing at an exponential rate, but the labels uh, would be super costly. And the way out are so-called surrogate tasks that you, for instance, have closed tab and text where somebody gives you part of the text. Uh, today, I went to the beep and bought some milk and eggs, and you are supposed to fill in the beep in that case, or uh, you have a, a blanked out part of an image and you have to hallucinate what goes there. This task is so powerful that it eventually enabled um, part of the revolution that we're now seeing in generative models, uh, systems which you can feed a bit of text and then have the model complete the remainder of the text uh, that is out there, um, GPT-3 and similar systems that you might know. Um, I guess I'm not reading this here from the slide. Many of you have seen examples where the system really started to create 
uh, text in um, somewhat meaningful English and um, uh, continued phrases that you started up with. And this is also what enabled a revolution in generative models in the visual world. So here are some examples from stable diffusion and things that you can potentially do with that. Um, start off with a scene where a part is occluded and then in paint this part, have the model hallucinate what you're missing in the scene. Um, doing super resolution, you start with a low res image and uh, up scale this image or, and that's probably most prominent in, in this article and many more uh, reporting about stable diffusion work uh, being text to image synthesis. We come up with just a text prompt, uh, a sunset over mountain range, oil on canvas, and this is what the system at the end of the day produces. And uh, just in a nutshell, the, the benefit of the stable diffusion approach was that after all its training, it has compressed essentially billions of training images in less than 10 gigabytes of storage because of a very specific sort of model design that we will look at on the upcoming slides. And that then enables this model to run on an arbitrary consumer card. So just try it out, code is on GitHub and run it at home or in a web browser uh, if you so choose, and um, do with just a text prompt uh, image synthesis. Now, I'd like to start off by just giving you the essential takeaways of why I believe that we have this revolution ongoing in generative models. And the first one is that self-supervision is now really key. Uh, we have eventually matured as a field beyond uh, just having to do supervised training. Uh, which enables us to leverage like a multitude of, of, of data that's out there. Uh, secondly, these models now finally allow us to generalize to novel tasks and novel data that we haven't seen beforehand, uh, generating styles that you haven't seen beforehand and the like. But much of the research um, in, in deep generative models and, and the performance gains that we have seen over the last couple of years was due to simply scaling up the models um, to, to size this in terms of like compute and data um, that eventually enabled a certain improvement. But that required essentially, yeah, just scaling up the model size required huge models also during inference. And with that, um, lots of memory made the models slow and at the end of the day, uh, required um, server hardware that only big tech companies have available. So um, the question is really why did the only way that, that the last couple of, of, of uh, prominent papers um, in, in this field um, pursue simply a scaling up to improve performance? And what would be a solution so that you eventually would have a powerful generative model that you could in, at the end of the day, also run on your machine. So let's look at that. But as I said, I, I was told to give you a little bit of background on generative modeling first, and then we come up uh, with some answers to these questions that I just posed. Um, generative model. Um, generative modeling aim at, uh, given some training data, eventually generate new samples from this distribution. Um, so given the training data, you want to learn a model of this distribution uh, that you could then potentially sample from and generate new data. And there are essentially two different ways to approach this problem, which at the end of the day uh, can be framed as a density estimation problem. Um, explicit density estimation techniques and implicit density estimation techniques. Um, explicit means that we explicitly define a model of this underlying data distribution that we then can potentially sample from. Implicit approaches don't directly give us an accessible sort of density estimation of this distribution, but only a model that we can sample from without having an accessible distribution. Now let's look at briefly what that actually means. Explicit modeling of the uh, distribution that we have here, this distribution of all sample of X, for instance. Assume that you have some prior distribution that you can draw from a Gaussian, for instance. Yeah? P zeta is a Gaussian distribution that we all know how to sample from. Then I can pipe this distribution through some deep neural network, so-called decoder, and turn it into an image 
image of a free here, for instance. This is just the mapping from a high dimensional vector here on the input side to a high dimensional, potentially even higher dimensional output image. And I can do that by choosing different inputs um, that I would eventually get different numbers here. But how do I know the latent Z here, this uh, latent point in this feature space that would give me, for instance, a seven or an eight? Uh, that I don't dare, I don't have any control over. For that, I would need an encoder. An encoder that would allow you to take an input image and then give you a bunch of of different locations. Yeah, that's why I have these curly brackets around here, a bunch of potential locations that all uh, correspond to different ways that you uh, write this letter three. And the same for the six. Uh, here would be then all the sixes. Here would be all the, the threes in this Latin feature space. Now we can put both together, the encoder and the decoder, and take an arbitrary input image, get its representation in the feature space, uh, which is here probabilistic in nature, uh, because there are many different renderings in this feature space uh, possible related to your input, and then decode that again um, into something which looks alike to the input. Not the same, but somewhat similar. And um, from a mathematical point of view, that means that the encoder essentially gives you access to the parameters of the distribution, in that case, for instance, the Gaussian distribution, its mean and potentially covariance matrix. And um, then you can sample from these Latin parameters and run that through a decoder, which eventually produces the output image. The, and that is essentially called a variational autoencoder. The other um, model that you might have heard of are generative adversarial networks. And just in very brief, what we have here is, again, our humble Gaussian distribution that we can sample from, pipe that again through a decoder, some generator network, and turn that into um, images. And we have a distribution of natural images, pictures that you have taken out there. What you now do is you stick a classifier network on top, a so-called discriminator. A simple model that just tries to figure out from, for an input image here, whether it comes from the distribution of real images X or from the synthesized distribution of Z. What you then have is you have the discriminator training compete against the generator training. Uh, this is called adversarial learning. And you want the discriminator evidently to figure out whether you fake the image or not. And the generator, you want the discriminator not to be able to, uh, to figure that out. And then both are competing against another and um, learning from another. Now with that, let's look at the challenges, the problems of one as opposed to the other approach. Very briefly, the uh, generative adversarial networks typically provide you with very high quality samples and they're super fast, but it's only an implicit density approach. We don't have access to the underlying distribution. Mode collapse is one of those standard problems that you, for instance, encounter. On the opposing end are variational autoencoders. Due to the encoder, they give us an, uh, a good coverage of our data distribution, an explicit uh, access to the density. They're also very fast. But um, we have this trade-off between coverage and quality here and only a lower bound on the underlying um, density distribution. So you either get great quality or you get great coverage. Um, what's the solution to that? I mean, this trade-off is essentially what is keeping us busy in, in generative models. Solution to that um, would be, for instance, autoregressive models. Autoregressive models where you go for an autoregressive factorization um, of your data distribution X, uh, which you just factorize by having XI depend on a series of previous seen items. You have X exact uh, likelihood in that case, which gives you great coverage and quality, but um, you have this unnatural ordering of the synthesis process. You essentially read images like you would be reading text and also know that in variable, it's slow at the model. And a solution to these problems here um, recently uh, have been the ever more prominent um, diffusion models. Um, I'll show you on the next slide how they actually work, but just in a nutshell, this is now defining the state of the art in terms of visual synthesis. They provide you um, with a powerful, very straight, uh, stable training routine, 
but they tend to be pretty much extensive due to the long Markov chain that I'm going to show you on the next slide. So in a nutshell, how do diffusion models work? I start with an input image, and then I add noise to this image in a lot of tiny steps. Let's say a thousand times, I'm adding a tiny bit of noise. If you repeat this a thousand times, at the end of the day, you're left with just nothing. Uh, just a signal which looks like you pluck the antenna cable out of your TV set, uh, just noise. Now we've essentially destructed content. What's the point of that? Doesn't seem to make any sense, right? Until you ask a neural network to turn that process around. Take an image which is noisy and make it a tiny bit less noisy. And here comes our autoencoder, in that case, a denoising autoencoder. You take the noisy version and want it to be denoised a tiny bit. Um, just very briefly, the key here is to have the same denoising autoencoder for all different time steps and then train that all joint. The challenge or the, the, the power of these models, the strength of these strong likely models, is at the same time also their big limitation. And that is they get lost in imperceptible details. They concentrate on getting each tiny bit of the image right. Uh, if you have some grass uh, out there which you want to synthesize, it's like each pixel of like each leaf of grass, how it's turned, uh, is supposed to be represented. And the problem with that is that most bits of your representation actually concentrate on these imperceptible details. Here, these details between the faces that you see here, which are not noticeable to, to me or you, uh, tiny, tiny changes of individual pixels, but the semantics that you are actually interested in, that you would actually be interested in, the differences in gender here, or the differences between the person wearing glasses and not wearing glasses, this is entirely lost by the model, or at least it's spending only very few bits on, on those details. So what we have is somewhat a learned JPEG compressor, a model that concentrates on all of these tiny little artifacts, but which almost neglects or spends only very few bits on the things that you actually care about the cement. Now, the solution to that problem so far was just making the model larger because then this tiny bit spent on semantics will eventually become more. And um, recent examples like DALI 2 and so on um, showed um, where this might essentially go. Now you have billions of parameters in the model then. But I would argue that this might help you in an IKEA world yeah, with the ordinary objects that are around. These you can then capture by just scaling up the models. But the blue Mauritius or this uh, painting here are individual examples which only occur once in the world. And just scaling up the train set, just scaling up the models would most likely not give you each of these individual artifacts that you might be interested in. In addition to that, it amounts to an enormous cost, not just during training, but most importantly, during inference. Yeah, these models then typically only fit on server hardware during inference, um, which allows big companies to run them, but not you personally. And I believe that with that, we have um, a reduction in diversity and creativity, because at the end of the day, it's like the millions out there using such a creative tool that really turn and crank up the creativity and not if there's a monopoly on such a crucial technology with just a few who can afford it. And that is especially important for a technology with some critical uh, societal impact. So I want to believe that we should democratize research on visual synthesis just to speed it also eventually up and not have, if you spin this wheel a bit further in, in two years, um, just like two companies being able to continue doing research on this field. Um, which means we need to render smaller models more effective. Uh, so in essence, yeah, the best camera is the one that you have with you. It might be that you could potentially scale these models further up and get more performance, but um, let's see how we can get um, these, these smaller models, uh, how far we can get with those uh, so that more people can actually do research with them or apply them at home. And the solution to that was taking the diffusion model that you've now seen, which is here, adding noise to the image, and then having a denoising autoencoder here, a unit, turn that process around. Having this diffusion model on top of 
a compression, compression stage. So the diffusion model does not run in the pixel domain anymore, but we take a convolutional approach first to eliminate all the bits that you, other than that, would not care about. Yeah? All those tiny details um, uh, which are not um, important for the semantics of the scene. So here you have an encoder-decoder architecture getting rid of those samples. Very briefly, how you train this part. Um, we coined this uh, the VQ-GUN approach. You have here an encoder and a, co a convolutional encoder and a decoder. And we go for a quantized representation, a co-book-based representation. And compared to what some of you might know, the VQVAE approach, which was there beforehand, we, we essentially replaced the L2 or L1 reconstruction loss that you have between input and reconstruction uh, by means of a perceptual loss and added, most importantly, your discriminator loss. That's why I showed it beforehand to favor realism over a perfect reconstruction that you would get from this first loss. If you then add on top a transformer model, an autoregressive model, then you get what we call the VQGAN approach with the transformer. You can also pre-print pre an initialization based on text. Um, and then you can do text to image synthesis, a yeah, doc, and then synthesize this doc, because this transformer is essentially now coupling the different local sort of quantizations that I showed you in step one uh, together and giving you the long range context. This model at the end of the day um, significantly helped to reduce coding length. So if you compare this against the first version of DALI, which actually only appeared uh, a few days after our EQGAN approach, only as a blog post and paper came significantly later, you can still see that for a four times lower coding length, four times higher compression, um, arguably this output that you get is much crisper than what this VAE style approach um, of, of DALI actually gives you. And um, four times compression in autoregressive models, which typically have a quadratic complexity amounts to a 16 times computational gain. As a result, this autoregressive approach could then synthesize the like you're seeing here, autoregressively produce um, those images and many, many more scenes. Um, you could then sample from this approach. Um, but in addition to that, you could also do additional conditioning tasks, uh, tasks where I showed a dog beforehand. I could prepend also a depth image and then do depth to image synthesis. So something like this here, uh, synthesize um, different um, 3D renderings of a scene um, in, in, in 3D, or you could do layout to image synthesis. You can potentially do super resolution where you take a low res image and synthesize something high res, complete images and the like. Now, when you have this compression stage beforehand, you could then add a conditioning signal like I've just shown you on the previous slide in terms of text, images, some semantic map, um, pipe that through an encoder network, and then utilize um, cross attention, essentially, to have this autoencoder structure here take this, um, this, this conditioning signal as site information into the synthesis process. And this now allows this diffusion model to do, for instance, text to image synthesis but also to do in painting if you start with an image where you have certain regions masked out. Let me show you some examples. Uh, here we use this cross attention mechanism for text to image synthesis and the resulting model is able to compress samples from complex text prompts um, and um, do then the uh, corresponding synthesis. Um, so you see examples of sunset over a mountain range vector image, or as I showed you before, it's sunset over a mountain range oil on canvas, and the model then transports the text into image, um, into image rendering. The approach itself is trained on a, a 256 squared resolution. Um, more recently, stable diffusion even felt 512 squared. Um, but the uh, generation itself can, by means of a sliding window trick, actually run on much higher resolution. So it's actually possible with that to do truly high resolution image synthesis, which becomes especially sort of helpful if you want to synthesize such panoramas. So you start with a semantic layout, which you can just draw in MS Paint, for instance, 
or whatever other tool. And then you can see that for the same layout, you can, because it's a stochastic approach, you can synthesize different renderings. You can change with that, for instance, the weather, time of day condition, um, or you change the layout to get different scenes with that created. So in a short uh, summary of this part, um, stable diffusion um, and the VQ gun approach essentially combine the efficiency of convolutions for representing the local details with the power, but also the complexity of diffusion models or autoregressive models for uh, modeling the long range context in the scene. So we get kind of the best of both worlds, where one is good, uh, the convolutions and local details, we choose that. And for the long range interactions, we utilize the powerful diffusion models, but not where it would be wasteful. With that, you get a significant increase in efficiency. It allows higher high resolution synthesis. And due to this generic conditioning that I've shown you, um, you can essentially solve a whole lot of different tasks, such as image to image uh, synthesis, text to image synthesis in painting tasks and so on, uh, all based on this simple concatenation the cross intention. So far, I have shown you how we can, based on autoregressive and diffusion models, learn image representations more effectively. Now, this compression essentially made things more effective. What I'm now going to discuss with you is not how we can make it more effectively, this learning, but what we should learn at all. Yeah. So, sounds a bit strange because we're doing machine learning. Sure, we want to learn things, but there are examples which I can show you where it becomes clear that certain things you probably don't want your model to learn. So let's consider, for instance, a great artist like Monet, here painted, for instance, by Benoit. Um, he was a great artist, yeah? But why was he out there when he was drawing trees out in the wild and looking at trees? I mean, as Ronald Reagan once said, a tree's a tree, yeah? How many more trees would an artist like Monet have to look at to finally understand the concept of a tree and be able to, to paint trees? Now, evidently Monet was great and there, there was a reason behind him doing that. Yeah, nature gives you with a whole plethora of different variations and you, you probably would not be as creative even in Monet to come up with all of those details. So what he did is he took in a particular example that he had in reality and utilized that to enrich what his model in the brain actually told him, so to speak, to render. Contrast that to what we're doing with deep models. We're essentially stuffing yeah, billions upon billions of samples into our neural networks to have them finally understand the entire world. Shouldn't we do a little bit more like Monet? And in that case, if, if, if you want to really enrich your creativity, here or there, during inference stage, go out, look at a tree, and utilize that for synthesizing novel trees. So what I'm trying to motivate here is a paradigm shift, although our field has been there beforehand, just long before deep learning. Um, Ayosha's um, important work on texture synthesis uh, by non-parametric sampling, for instance, more than 20 years ago, um, already went into a non-parametric direction, which is essentially what I want to advertise here a bit. So it's kind of also a mix uh, and a bit of a back to the future, which we're actually sort of aiming for. So besides um, having autoregressive models as expressive models for long range concept, uh, context and being expensive models for local details, which we've seen beforehand, um, we don't want to, in that case, represent local details in this generative model at all. Yeah? Don't waste the power on any modeling of local details at all. Not just less than that, but no uh, bits should be wasted by these powerful generative models on the local details. Rather, utilize a database of patch examples. So independent of your training set, separately from that, you have a data set of images collected, or rather of image patches collected. When you do synthesis during inference time, you simply look up relevant patches from this data set. Yeah, you have here a retrieval function, which based on some conditioning, based on the task that you, you want to solve, retrieves important samples from this data set, 
Um, in our case, that means this data set is disjoint from the training set. It's uh, random patches collected from a large data set, um, large data set meaning like 9 million images, and we've collected 20 million patches from those images. And then the autoregressive model or the diffusion model can focus on learning the composition of such patches, but it does not have to concentrate on the local texture and appearance details which you have in the patches themselves. So how can we train such a model? We start off with our powerful generative model, for instance, a diffusion model or an autoregressive model. And what you usually would do during training is you sample an image from your training set X, and then you want your model here to essentially approximate, it's a parametric distribution, P zeta, approximate your original data distribution. So far, so good. That's what we do in likelihood-based models. But in contrast, we now have an additional database of patches separate from this set X. And based on our image that we now want to reconstruct, we look in this database for nearest neighbors, for similar samples. And now our tasks of, task of approximating distribution becomes easier because now we have a conditional distribution here. Um, the P beta is now conditioned in addition to that on these nearest samples. So if you, for instance, want to reconstruct this uh, eagle here, this might be the nearest neighbors which you retrieve and you get the idea that now you don't need to learn feathers and things like that because your nearest neighbors already tell you what these look like. You just need to understand how to assemble them and that's what this model can then concentrate on. Now, we don't feed these images directly in there. We pipe them through a fixed encoder, yeah, for instance, clip. Uh, which we squeeze in here, and that's essentially the training paradigm. Now, to wrap that up, during inference, um, you don't need any access to the training data, so this is out, uh, we're not cheating here, and you have a separate database of images, and you can now condition on, for instance, a class label, you could condition on text, or do it in an unconditional fashion, and just sample related patches, and um, stuff that into your inference engine, into your diffusion model and conditioned on those, um, in that case, synthesize the image. The important is that we could now simply swap these data sets, these databases during inference time, uh, exchange them for data that we've never seen during training. And with that change the task, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. Um, just as a take home message here, this STEMI parametric approach provides you with most gain when the data set, when the problem that you're having is most complicated. When you deviate from your training set scenario most, I guess that also makes sense, then you have most gain from this database here. And this approach significantly improves upon an approach that does not have these retrieval augmentation. But in addition to that, this retrieval augmentation provides you a lot of flexibility because you can swap this database. Database during inference time without having to base for wiki art and the model then produces style transfer. Uh, gives you a stylistic representation or a stylistic rendering of those images. And with that, you can uh, generalize to different styles without having to ever retrain um, your neural network. You can do the obvious things that, such as zero-shot text-to-image synthesis and create happy vegetables, if you care about that, or a happy tiger, which is standing in a kitchen. And um, just the last word on that, retrieval augmentation, you might ask, like these non-parametric approaches typically are costly. It turns out that thanks to Google's work, work on the scan library, an efficient nearest neighbor retrieval algorithm, approximate nearest neighbor algorithm, which retrieves within 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second uh, from a database of 20 million patches, um, there's actually no um, uh, additional computational cost, quite the contrary, because the model in that case becomes significantly smaller compared to ADM and other related approaches. We actually achieve the 10 times speed up. Now, the model can be smaller by retrieving samples. The retrieval costs you just some 100 milliseconds extra, but since the model is smaller, you, buy, you much make 
the paper, uh, which now appeared in Europe this year, has a lot of additional comparisons uh, against other approaches. I don't want to bore you with that, but rather come to a conclusion. And uh, again, summarize that I believe you should not waste powerful generative models these days on perceptual compression tasks. Um, standard convolutions are much better at representing local details. Rather have the uh, diffusion models and autoregressive models concentrate on semantics, on long range context in a scene. And secondly, don't learn the actual samples in the autoregressive or diffusion models, rather have these models learning how to combine such samples, but not how to render the samples themselves. That typically, this retrieval augmentation typically leads to a much smaller model. It improves the performance and the autoregressive model can then concentrate on what it's really good at. And that also allows for a very convenient post hoc transfer. So after the model has been trained, transfer of the model to novel domains um, that you have never seen during training. So with that, let me thank you for your attention, show you at the top right an example of what other people have now done with stable diffusion, and um, give credits to the great team that I'm having here in Munich uh, who made all of this work possible. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer.